I could go on a cruise ship with no internet connection for 10 days and I should come back without any remorse as well as without any fear that I will lose revenue. Yeah, you make me think you're like the the sub guru for Microsoft. <laughs> At the end of the day to be a real real influencer you need to have 100 guys who take the bullet for you and 1000 guys who will tell you that they'll take the bullet for you not take the bullet you were number one on product hub talk to us about that piece of the journey you should on the outer layer do what everyone understands and on the inner layer do what no one can do Ooh. that gives you the highest form of leverage what are three common mistakes you see people make when they go to build microsoft three points picking an outdated idea or even timed idea as of today second thing is build your systems for 2 to 3 years ahead in time that comes in two parts then third point is understand the monetizable window of every technology every landscape that you are working on what would you say to someone who's having doubts about launching micro saas app to make 100k from an employer you need to master a skill to make 100k from from an app you need to master the world Ooh. that's my fundamental philosophy Welcome to episode 13 of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today, we have Ramsri Gautam Gola. He has bootstrapped two AI SaaS apps, Question AI and Supermeme AI, to over 100k ARR with new employees. He also teaches and does consulting in NLP and has a combined following of of over 50,000 across various different platforms, LinkedIn and Twitter. Ramsri, really excited to learn how to make 100k like you <laughs> thanks a lot mark for the introduction and my pleasure to be here have been following you for quite some time and it's great to you know meet e meet in person for the first time yes <laughs> so i i just have to confess so as you know i i work for nvidia etc cetera, etc cetera, so you have your day job i think all my life been thinking about side hustles and me following you has been a way for me to live vicariously side hustle through you and <laughs> um today is the day where i learn you know a little beyond just following you from afar you know <laughs> awesome awesome sounds good yes so tell me how does it feel to have bootstrap two companies to 100k in arr with no employees um first feels great i mean only in this year it has grown to you know 100k in arr mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of things were in i mean looking back uh, a lot of things were not planned in the sense that bootstrapping not having any employees and uh, even question is completely solo by me mm-hmm. doing all of these were not planned as such just as tech progressed as my thought process evolved about building saas or understanding more about entrepreneurship marketing and all these things uh it's the path that i chose uh and uh, i sprinkled a lot of freedom in my path so i took the path that you know that gave me the highest freedom to operate and this is what i narrowed on to uh it's just at the end of the day i look at it like a way of life how you mm. how, how one designs uh, themselves in the world while adhering to the you know fundamentals uh, it's been a very interesting journey and um, almost 5 years since i quit my job in silicon valley and moved back so 2018 to 2024 uh, quite a bit of journey on content creation courses uh i kind of say this to joke with my friends people identify me with either saas or some students learners who took my courses uh etc but for me it was like an unofficial phd uh about how to make money on the internet as a techie if you don't have a job what are all the sources available and what gives what kind of roi what gives what kind of freedom uh in accountability and all these things yeah oh, i love that unofficial phd how to make money as a techie 
when you don't have a job. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I know for sure SAS PhD, you should definitely launch that course. I would I would technically buy it. Um how come you didn't go do your PhD? Um my dad wanted me to mm. very, very vehemently. Uh actually my dad did that. Okay. Because I mean, even I mean, just a little bit of divergence just for sure, 30 sure, seconds. Sure. My grandfather passed away quite some time back, but he just told my father once that go do a PhD, that's the highest form of education. And my dad, I think he got a PhD at 55 or 60, like through distance education. Um, but nevertheless, uh, he wanted me to do PhD so that it's the highest form of education. Mm -hmm. um, and I took a different route in a lot of ways. He wanted me to be a doctor, but I gave, I evaded that as the elder one and gave that to my sister. So now she is a doctor. Okay. <laughs> When my father wanted me to be different kind of doctor, if not medical doctor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. still I awaited that and I became an entrepreneur kind of. Uh, it's it's an interesting journey, but uh, so would you? Um, so huh. yeah, I'll finish it in ten seconds. Very good, very good. So the main question. Um, I saw PhDs at close quarters when I was in Arizona State University as a master student. Mm -hmm. I saw several PhDs. My group of friends were fortunately or unfortunately almost three or four PhDs. Seeing their struggles, I never wanted to be them. That's the only thing. Because inevitably you are going to get frustrated at the problem that you have or the lab that you're working on or the professor. Some changed, some dropped out of PhD, some changed schools to a different PhD. So seeing all this, I thought not the right thing for me. Mm. Yeah. Sorry for me. No, no, this wrong, is but, good. Uh, yeah. This is good because okay. I, I went through that process as an international student and it's not, most definitely not an easy process. And it's almost as being, um, you're not necessarily an entrepreneur. You're kind of like an entrepreneur, but you make no money. And yes, you have these deliverables that you have to hit. Otherwise, you don't get your freedom. If you're an international student. You ain't getting out. You go back to where, you know, you're sort of from. And you don't get to at least in America, um, play, play in that market or play in the top data science market in the world. So um, I, right. I, I really admire your path. I, that's why I sort of asked that question, actually. So it, it's nice. <laughs> I, I like to collect data, just like you and I are data scientists. And it continues to collect <laughs> data to show people all of the different possibilities that are out there for their career. Do what you want, but back it up with data. <laughs> <laughs> just, just so that people don't have yeah. questions on your internal reasoning. <laughs> mm, I hear you. So can you give us an overview of your two companies currently? Sure, absolutely. So question is solo bootstrapped by me. Both of them are AI SaaS apps. So question is an edtech app where you can put in some text and it generates quizzes. So quizzes, kind of the quizzes that you see in middle school, high school, multiple choice questions, true or false, fill in the blanks, you name it, match the following, all these things. So text to quizzes mm -hmm. and primary target audience are, you know, learners, students who are learning or teachers who are creating these quizzes or at tech companies. And on the other hand is super meme, which is an AI meme generator. So you just put some text, the feeling that you have in mind, it generates memes, complete memes. By that, I mean the appropriate meme template coupled with the right text in the right text boxes. And that's what it is. And uh, just to quote the numbers, uh, so question uh, surpassed 100K users, mm. uh, 100,000 uh, 100, users solo, and it's been a long four year journey. Super meme got a little bit viral by the nature of it. And we are, I think, close to 700K users. Uh, absolutely zero marketing spend or any ad spend, no influencer spend, nothing. World has been uh, fortunate and in some ways we are grateful. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, 100,000 users, 700,000 users on Super Meme. That's 
That's really exciting. Why are memes so important to the world? Yeah, I think a standard way of learning about something. When I mean learning, it's not just education. You can even call it just getting informed about news or anything. Is that you read through a paragraph, you eyes, your eyes processes that paragraph, then you try to extract information, then your mind maps the important bits of it, then you understand it. Uh, I think there's quite a lot of latency there. Mm. Second is, for example, if there is a meme, you already understand the core emotion uh, of the meme so that the baseline, so 80% of the information is already in your head once you look at the meme. Drake doesn't like something and likes something. Mm -hmm. It's already there. Now I just put two words let's say NVIDIA and Apple, something like that. Right. You just immediately get it. I don't need to write a paragraph for you to explain it. Hmm. Similarly, you want to either consume information or you want to distribute information, which is marketing. You can do the same thing with memes, which is deliver the message that you want in split second once, it, once they look at the template. And... Because 80% of the knowledge is already embedded in the people because they know the meme template in and out, its usage in uh, by multiple people, etc. Uh, that's how at least I look at it. Yeah. No, no, it's super interesting because I see very respectable people, you know, use memes and enjoy memes. I enjoy memes myself. And I, I think it's one of those um, maybe underappreciated forms of content delivery information communication Absolutely. and then what you just said there it made me think of a meme is almost like um kind of like a laura adapter where i i just you know a little a little tweak and i could i could go change this image to mean something completely different so that was a that was Absolutely. a cool thought Absolutely. so i wish there was a a Forbes list that would showcase people, you know, because Forbes, 30 under 30, 20 under 20, 40 under 40. Um, so I wish it was a list that showed people who bootstrapped um, their startups with ARR at all different scales. Because naturally, they, they tend to focus on, hey, bootstrap to 10 billion, blah, blah, blah. But bootstrapping to 100K right. over a certain period of time, I think that's beautiful. Um, why, did you, yeah. why did you not take that traditional startup funding path yeah uh, one of the things that i all uh, i realized you know post the evolution of ai and all the things that happened in the past is as not just entrepreneur as someone who is aware of things if you want to stay ahead of the curve one is to identify shifting ground while you're on it Mm. That is basically identify the magnitude and direction of the shifting ground while you're on it. And it is hardest thing to do. And you can only do that if you have a bird's eye, bird's eye view of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, for example, I'll tell you one example, one simple thing, which is there is quick commerce. There is e-commerce. I'll just explain it in 10 seconds. Nothing more. E-commerce. Amazon, eBay, you order something, you get it in two days, any product. Mm -hmm. Quick commerce is, let's say, 10-minute delivery. I don't know if it's in the US or not, but in India and several countries, it's very popular. I ordered order a curd uh, or yogurt packet right now, and I get it delivered in 10 minutes before I finish my meal, mm. if I want to. Do. Wow. Right? And uh, one thing is that, while when it started, it started just as a grocery delivery platform. But as things progressed, even the technical things, I mean, uh, I mean, technology got added onto it by that. I mean, you can order a razor, you can order children's blue books and all these things. So uh, just like I said, the trend when it started, it's not very apparent that quick commerce will eat into e-commerce e-commerce's profit margins mm. because on Amazon you sell electronics and all these things, right? But 
it's only evident if you see how the evolving patterns of where quick commerce now it is taking a huge chunk of revenue not starting as a direct competitor similarly there are these patterns where previously it it used to, an <clears throat> an idea's relevance was 5 to 7 years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you had a monetizable window of a new technology for example 5 to 7 years now think about ai and rapidly evolving let's say even consumers behavior as well as technology maybe that time has shrunk to 2 or 3 years so an idea's relevance as well as monetizable window it could have shrunk to 1 year 2 year 3 years it has definitely shrunk that's what i mean mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. only evident if you look at it from a bird's eye perspective right similarly um if you take the let's say vc funded route the premise is that people are focused on one idea long term and are passionate and are willing to work work for next 7 years exit or ipo things like that but you know like i mentioned shifting trends ideas relevance might have shrunk people's patterns of how they operate now they love fractions of everything they don't want to own real estate but only own a fraction of it you know there are some leasing options like that mm-hmm. uh gen z people love not owning not owning anything and just you know having uber and other things mm-hmm. just like transportation so when those patterns are evolving and can you identify similar things where an entrepreneur doesn't want to dedicate his life for 5 to 7 years and wait for an exit uh and can you make that happen for yourself mm-hmm. that's the fundamental question that i asked so then i started fractional ownership in companies building them part time not making my life or death survival on it but it i let it rather grow on the side uh just over years like what question did mm-hmm. i always fo- primarily focused on consulting to get my next month salary yep and always question is like a star baby who i wanted to just you know let it not survive but it always kept on surviving course then github uh, library mm-hmm. then i made like an ui with no code then i made a uh, full fledged saas right similarly just casually by not burning any midnight oil no stress uh, no vcs uh, asking me for quarterly updates no one in the world no one in the world wanted it to succeed but i just it's like planting a seed and just pouring some water now and now and then mm. and now the mango tree is there to reap fruits right yes can someone build that in business why can't you flip it and uh, try to do the same and i just did that with question super meme is also similar where the co-founders have their own full time thing so whenever there are feature priorities we don't fight among each other at all we just say do it when you get free if it's 3 months later so be it mm. and the only thing that we are true to is that cancel button in the software should work so that no one is offended that we are taking the money mm. and we took a unique approach that's that also fits into the whole arena which is we never sold any lifetime deals everything is monthly so if you don't find value this month you can cancel we have not taken any money from you up front on any promise mm. and i figured why don't you create this new era of entrepreneurship fractionally operated heavy heavily uh, you know heavily uplifted like an exoskeleton exoskeleton with ai which does most of the things no marketing spend no upfront ltds long term i mean lifetime deals nothing can you do something out of the blue uh 
something odd that hasn't been done or hasn't been done structurally. Yes. And uh, just explored it and looks like there's a path and we just made it. And that's what it is. Mm. Did it? <laughs> and I will tell you one thing, mm-hmm. uh, just to finish it off. The biggest, biggest thing I always wanted was I could go on a cruise ship with no internet connection for 10 days and I should come back without any remorse as well as without any fear that I will lose lose revenue. And I created such system where mm. it's a $15 subscription. No one is offended because I didn't, if I'm running an agency, I can't go on a cruise trip for 10 days. There's one client of the other or the another always on some deadline, they'll keep pushing me where's the delivery. And even if I have a team, I need to do quality check of the team. Mm-hmm. A $15 SaaS, even if you if I, if it, it is charged on credit card today for you, you write me an email, I respond back in 20 days, $15 is not gonna make or break your bank. You will just report it as, you know, charge back and just stay idle, nothing. <laughs> And magically, can you extrapolate it to make a livable income in India, which I do with question $4,000, mm-hmm. probably $600 is operating cost. So $3,400 in profit. It's kind of like you gifted a decent uh, senior data scientist salary, like 40 k 50 k is, it's not a bad amount. It's a decent data scientist salary in India, unless you're in the, top of the game. Mm-hmm. So I thought, can you just gift yourself a senior data scientist salary without really uh, not having the fear of layoff yes. uh, mm-hmm. and not having a boss just happen by luck, a bit of luck, a bit of whatever, being at the right place, right time, however you want to call it. Yeah. That's, that's quite exciting. And you know, you talked about, I like this fractionally operated concept in addition that is billing and it seems billing an exoskeleton with AI and sort of, you know, completing that whole thing. Right. Are you, are you envisioning your collection? Cause now you have two, are you, in, I imagine you're going to build more now that you've seen the playbook and kudos to you to sharing the playbook as well. Um, are you also seeing this as kind of like a farm? of mango trees almost where you're just, I don't have, you know, one tree is not basically feeding me. It's this collection of trees or collection of plants that are feeding me. Are you envisioning your sort of career like that? Hmm. Um, in some ways, yes. And in some ways not. Okay. Uh, by that, I mean, one is I, I love minimalism. First mm. of all, I ha- I had three SaaS apps. One was Super Translate AI, yes, uh, which was I grew it up to like 300, 400, uh, 400 MRR, like for four hundred dollars MRR, mm-hmm. etc. For whatever reasons, I moved away from it because the team had a B two B vision, etc. Mm-hmm. One is if you really want to be minimalistic, you should have as many less emails as possible. So even business emails, I hate it when I add the third one. So short answer is unless one of this is sold, I don't want to start an another one purely from a cognitive load perspective. Mm. It has got nothing to do with not lacking ideas. I, I think definitely just by being in the game, I know several ideas that I can build, but uh, just like Kung, Kung Fu Panda, I thought, whatever random branching energy ideas that you have, can you channelize into just to these two SaaS apps? Mm. Fit it into a feature if you can. Interesting. If there is a SaaS idea, try and see if it can fit into a feature into your existing apps. (laughs) And that is exactly how I looked at the last one and a half year. And as builders, there is this shiny object syndrome. Every time you see a new technology, you imagine in a pool of money, drowning money, where you build upon the technology and it goes viral overnight. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, do I really need that cognitive overload of uh, stress uh, 
to be really honest now i am tapering towards more freedom mm-hmm. not towards more money high roi mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, more money uh, i would love more money that but i look at for me once you pass the middle class barrier let's call it upper middle class mm-hmm. barrier mm-hmm. it is all about uh, uh, time uh, money is freedom for me yes if you give me if you write me a 100k check today i would i think i would just go and just keep doing youtube uh, every day mm-hmm. and just let it grow uh, monetize my youtube or just share my knowledge uh, i would not start a, even a third saas app that's super if interesting if you just write me 100k hmm. <laughs> um yeah this this question came to me last night so the traditional vc funding route would say all right i give you 200k I'll take, you know, five percent, ten percent of your company, um, and you know you're going to work sort of on this idea, right? What if I came to you and said, um, "I'll give you five million, right? Get me back the money whenever. Um, at least I I need back, let's say, ten, right? Not necessarily a hundred, because VC says five. I'm looking for a hundred. Are you looking for more? I give you that, and I right. say, go work on whatever the hell you want. I give you a five-year yeah. window. I don't care what you build. Have fun. Yeah. Would you? Yeah. Would you grab it? Uh, if it's a hard clause that I have to give back ten million in the next right after five years, probably no. Fair enough. Uh, mm-hmm. def- most likely no. Uh, if you have an open-ended timeline, then probably yes. Okay. The only reason is that. I want to play the game while loving it. Mm. And if you give me that 5 million check today and don't have a hard clause on timeline, I will go and build distribution. Like Ram Sri's let's say personal brand etc or what he does. I will go and build let's say AS as apps with nextjs on my YouTube as templates. Mm-hmm. I have this idea as idea. Let's build it i'm going to just build it with you along with you on the youtube channel and open source it and so i i'm going to make uh, i'm going to uh, build distribution enough that ramsri is like a household name in the ai saas space uh, and monetizing from there once you have let's say half a million followers mm-hmm. and making it let's say 10 million roi could be possible because if you are at the leverage to directly raise 100 million i write a 10 million check to my existing previous five years vc and take the it's just like you know he got a uh, vesting you know he got he got vesting stocks for the next round at a, at the current price mm-hmm. right just like that mm-hmm. that's how i look at it i would just go and build distribution and i i think um, this comes from one perspective again looking ahead of the curve which is as ai bots ai companies ai is gonna generally be a household name everywhere the marketing as we know would have little personal attachment to people there's like a brand brand advertisement if it's gonna influence 100 people to make the buy decision today i think it's going to influence only 50 people to make the buy decision today uh, because they are inherently they think there's an ai behind it perhaps not a human who mm. created that marketing material so basically if you build personal brand will have higher roi in 5 years than today that's my fundamental belief because at the end of the day people are uh irrational but want to think they are rational that's that in making any decision mm-hmm. and uh, if you just say the same content as a human walking talking uh, on a stage then they are going to have more affinity towards you in the world of ai generated content mm-hmm. now it's a fair play every influencer has a fair play but in the world of excess ai 
that fair play bias will shift towards humans who have little level of authenticity. That's how I look at it. So we're going to be looking for what is real versus what is generated, right? What 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 comes yes. from a human versus what is AI generated. That's that's quite um. Yes, there's hmm. a little survey that people did with blogs. Basically, they took AI written blogs, they took uh, human written blogs, they labeled some of the AI written blogs as human, they labeled some of the human written blogs as AI, mm-hmm. etc. They did all this research survey. At the end of the day, people's reading time, even if it is a human written content labeled as AI, was significantly low. The Just by the fact that There's a small headline that this is an AI augmented content. People just read one line and just skip. The screen time of it was very less. Hmm. I I think it's at the end of the day, there is nothing called as marketing. It is just people's, you need to understand people's psychology enough to cross the barrier of putting credit card numbers on whatever system you give. That is marketing. I am enjoying I am enjoying this this so far. You're spitting some knowledge, man. This is this is good shit. <laughs> um this distribution thing on on personal brand. Uh, right now it's all about following, numbers of followers, right. et cetera, et cetera. And that's right. sort of your metric for your corresponding impact. But I I think even in my own journey, um, I've sort of learned by watching people have way more followers than me. Uh, <clears throat> right. that that's the, okay, there's external metrics and then there's internal metrics, meaning audience activation. As you're saying, do I have the influence to cross someone's psychology and, and they like my business enough for them to put the credit card down? I think that's, that's the measure of an influence. I guess you could argue both ways, right? Because one is just, as you're saying, a distribution channel, get the message out. Mm. Um, but I guess if you get mm. the message out to 10 million people and nobody buy, it, it is also a waste of time to a degree, right? I have a little more aggressive take on that. Okay, let me hear you. It's called take a bullet. Who is willing to take a bullet for you? Mm. For example, theoretically, uh, you are in the middle of 100 people, okay? You are the, the guy to them, the god to them, however it is, okay? Now, is it okay to sh- have 100 people with shallow attachment or reverence to you? Or if there is an attacker in the room with a gun, there's a one at one person who came into the room with a gun and he's aiming at you. Mm-hmm. Now, 100 shallow influencers will just pave the way for the bullet to directly hit you. No doubt. But you have five confident guys by your side, Mm -hmm. guys or girls, Mm -hmm. who rever you. They will take the bullet for you. Mm -hmm. Now, in the take a bullet scenario, does it matter if there are 1,000 people in the room and they all pave the way for the bullet to directly hit you? Or if there are p- three people who will attack the attacker, probably the two will get killed, but the third guy will snatch the gun from the killer. That is a really hard hitting question that I always think as well. Mm-hmm. What's your direct influence? Basically call it, how much vehemence do you have on someone? Like, I mean, how vehemently does someone not just admire you, rever you? Mm. to take that bullet Mm. at the end of the day to be a real real influencer yes you need to have 100 guys who take the bullet for you and thousand guys who will tell you that they'll take the bullet for you not take the bullet (laughs) yeah you make me think you're like the the sat guru for micro (laughs) sas business This, this is fun um how would you define a micro SaaS versus a SaaS? Because I think that's a super important distinction. They may get lumped. Right. They may be the same. I don't know. I'm, I'm actually genuinely asking. Sure. Absolutely. 
So basically you make the operations bare minimal Mm -hmm. and you can have employees. Uh, It's not a hard bound rule that Microsoft shouldn't have any employees. But at the end of the day, a SaaS at a smaller scale where your aim is never grow beyond 10 people in two ways. One is you should operate in a niche such that the target addressable market itself gets capped at the 100K MRR or 50K MRR. Because there is, you know, philosophically it thinks, uh, we think that anyone can build a microsas in any domain. I don't think that is the case. Hmm. You should be smart enough to fly under the radar of big companies, but have enough altitude that it lifts you from the general job kind of money. That is, you know, somewhat of a, you know, mid altitude stealth fighter bed, fighter jet is what Microsoft is, if executed well. Hmm. You need to pick a niche where if you're making all, let's put it this way. If you're really making uh, 1 million ARR or 2 million ARR, Adobe, all these NB, uh, whatever companies are directly are in that space are going to come after you mm. inadvertently. There is no doubt about it. You build a chat with PDF and you get to 2 million ARR. Adobe is going to integrate it directly within their PDF tools, chat with PDF. Mm. There is no way you can avoid that. Now, the smart thing is that operate in the zone where it's not a table stake for them to kill you. You are not, you are an occasional mosquito where you just bite and go. You are not hurting them enough to go and switch on the mosquito coil and uh, fire up the bat, mosquito electricity bat and kill you. You just make, occasionally make here and there splashes some money here and there and probably probably exit out and uh, give you more freedom. Uh, so you should pick a niche and business problem as well as domain, vertical, everything in that zone. Mm. Because I will tell you the simplest uh answer for you to understand whether something is a microsas or not if you think once you scale you will hire 20 people 30 people you will raise funds you need to raise funds that's not a microsas according to me Mm -hmm. people will have different opinion Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's because microsas is not the way to look at a it as a pre-step to building a SaaS with VC funded company. That's the notion that I think most people get wrong. People think that it's like a pre-seed round to seed round. Right. Where seed round is the VC funded company with 100 employees that you want to build. People think micro SaaS is a segue, narrow segue into that big canal. But I don't look at it that way. It I look at it this way. Do you ever play badminton? And if you become a very professional badminton player, after that, do you go and build a football team of 11 people? Mm. No, right? It is not a... Your badminton skills of single player or dual player, double player game is not a segue to building a football team of cricket, cricket team of 11 people and heading them. It is a different game altogether. Where as... Roger and all this Nadal and all this, they know the target audience, they have the brand that they get and all these things, right? They are not, they know exactly where they operate. It's not like they've become famous there. Now they go and start a football team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's the biggest fundamental contrast that people see. People think that Microsoft, once you build experiment there, now you're ready for VC funded $100 million company. I look at it the different way. You consciously made a choice to play a single player game like chess or a dual player doubles game, mixed doubles, whatever game. And that's it. Mm-hmm. You work, you have consciously made that decision. Now they are, there are no 11 players banking on you as the captain. 
there are no hundred they did not buy you out into Chelsea and other teams with hundred millions so that you need to give ROI to them. None of those are there. Mm-hmm. You just play on your own on different turfs and you get some branding and you're cool with it. Yeah. Oh, that's that was a clean clean expose. Um how are you thinking about sort of micro SaaS apps when it comes to um your total revenue. So in that scenario, a Microsoft app by itself might not necessarily hit you to your sort of financial goal. And I think, to be honest, you're in a very unique position from the perspective of um, you are in, you're, you're playing geographic arbitrage, essentially. Right? You, right. you live, right. you can, I, I've heard great things about the cost of living in India and the quality of food. I, if I get to eat all that kind of food every day, in America, you know, that food yeah. is so good as, as Indian food, in, in my opinion. Um, so you live up, your quality of life is a lot higher for a much cheaper price. So I think, what what's your, if you had to live in America, how would, do you think your mindset would be in that case? Hmm. So I'll give you one uh, interesting example. Mm-hmm. So there's tier one in any country where if you're in tier one, you can have a personal cook, personal driver, um, personal laundry laundry guy for you and house help. And you can have uh, take care for your kids, etc. Mm-hmm. Basically, you are an employee or entrepreneur, but you give direct livable income for several other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You are indirectly or directly mm-hmm. supporting them. Now, the biggest question is, with your skill set, your money, you can be in tier one in India versus uh, an average 400K making Silicon Valley employee with $1.5 million home that runs the next 25 years of your mental and physical, all the space, mental and physical bandwidth. You... Personally, you have to choose what appeals most to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like I mentioned, um, I mean, not like I mentioned, I never inspire people to move back to India by putting a nationalistic perspective to it. I put a very, very personal perspective to it. I love Indian food, Indian culture. I, I, for whatever reason, I don't watch general popular sitcoms. I haven't watched a single season of Friends and other things. Not that I don't want to, it never appealed to me. Similarly, my friends in the same city who grew up like me, they are well adapted to that culture, custom food. Now we, they eat like Americans, probably better than Americans, uh, you know, on the lean, clean meat and other things. And they are quite happy buying the, you know, 1.5 million dollar home. At the end of the day, it's personal choice. And I absolutely love living in India, Indian food. And I want to be tire one, go where you're respected kind of thing. Mm. And, and, you know, in some way I have some leverage because I can get remote jobs and I, I, I have built SaaS apps to be able to uh, live tire one in India where I have, of course, I don't have like a driver, chauffeur and everything, but some there's like some help for cooking, some help for taking care of the kid, couple of hours, and there's some help for cleaning. And there's, I, I provide indirect or direct employment to five or six people. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be very honest, uh, I think most people kind of don't recognize this, but if you really live in a gated community apartment in proper Indian city, uh, it's not even first world country. I would call it zero eighth world country. Mm. Like extremely, there are sky villas that you can get for half a million. Literally, you can have a 24 hour live-in made. Uh, I am not there. I don't aim to be there i'm just telling you the lifestyle yeah, with yeah. half a million you can get anything in five minutes ten minutes uh 
uh, you send your kid to school because those kind of communities have a school attached to what? it. You basically live, I would say, in 2050. Wow. Uh, kind of. If you are in the super wealthy category mm-hmm. and uh, there is literally help for every single thing. Mm. Uh, you want to fix something, you can, in half an hour, you can fix this bulb by, you know, putting on an app, uh, requesting in an app. There's like uh, high-end service that is of- offered by the apartment complex itself. You have any problem just, and there are, I would say in some of them, even high-end restaurants, kind of like fine dining uh, restaurants built in the apartment community complex. Uh, That's not my dream. I'm just saying you can really live like a zeroth world country person. Even I would say what 100 million, 150 million well people in America live, you can live that lifestyle with less than half a million. Wow. And you can take luxury vacations. In Mm. India, the top, top kind of places, probably $400, $500 you can offer a day. You can get the highest form of service, exceptionally great food and other things. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's just what do you want from your life? Yeah. And for me, I have some level of... Just by the virtue of being born here, eating this food, I have affinity towards this culture and food. Mm-hmm. And some people replicate this, even finding Indian communities outside India, wherever they are, they form communities. But I personally think it's not a complete drop in replacement at the end of the day. You know, the mangoes that you get here get transported in ship for seven days and you get there. Mm-hmm. Nothing beats the mango that you get here. Things like that, small little things. And uh, yeah, for me, I have found at the end of the day, short answer is you need to find what is the happy place for you. Mm -hmm. I always Mm -hmm. use this happy place word, even with my wife, because at the end of the day, it is finding about happy place for you, your family, and nothing to do with any of the things. If for some reason, you know, whatever, Society, government, all these things bother you. If your happy place is some other country, so be it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's how I look at it. Wow. Yeah. That's a good, those are some very good points. Uh, I didn't know you could live that well um, in India. So uh, I'll be taking some notes. Um, but I, I definitely have to visit <laughs> at some point. How would you, absolutely. Yeah. How would you, um, what would you say are the major? components of an AI SASA versus let's say a regular SASA. Right. I think one of the primary factors is cost Mm. because um, when we were thinking about SAS previously, by default, you would assume that you have 90 or 95% profit margins Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. generally in SAS. I don't think that's the case with AI SAS where the profit margins could be as low as even 30% if you're running your own models. And uh, so one one thing is that. Second thing is now if API, API is offered to everyone, where do you hit it out to stand out from the crowd? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because if GPT-4 kind of, you know, GPT-4 kind of API is offered to everyone, where does your mode stand? Is the mod in a business vertical? Is the mod in the team? Is the mod in the UI UX that you have? Uh, all these things. And uh, and uh, one very, very critical component that I say is the deltas that you give. Today, you let's say you had a regular SAS and you look that after five years, all the things that would have been were cosmetic in the previous era. Mm-hmm. But with AI era, you just integrate the next best. For example, when I started with my ASS question, it was built on T5 transformer models that I trained. Now there was one good thing, which is about having a vision that whatever models come later, 
really will argument the teachers in one click they can generate this 150 multiple choice questions mm -hmm. back then when i released with t5 models people called it this is incredibly bad why would someone pay for it mm. but i didn't do any technological breakthrough i just waited for the gpt open api and i just integrated that by replacing one url of my own hosted to this api now people call it magic mm. and um that happened then you have a multimodal api now you can upload even images etc and now you can generate even for math questions you can generate high quality quizzes so by the virtue of thinking ahead of time where you have an arbitrage basically with time and whatever marketing etc and you need to envision that and see what delta do you give six months later one year later and one of the fundamental things is building your systems according to that mm. because a lot of microsoft folks what they do is they try to optimize premature optimization for profitability that's how i would call it so everything is built if you have premature optimization for profitability your tech stack is built on the assumption that open ai api will stay the same both technologically and price wise mm -hmm. now there was a time where i was making thousand dollars but i was shelling out two thousand dollars for open ai now if i had optimized my systems i had lot of i would have had lot of tech debt but i had the idea just from the trajectory that compute will become cheaper models will be become better now without changing any of the tech stack my open ai bill just from the virtue of going through their iterations has dropped from two thousand dollars to three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars mm. i didn't do anything they just made their advances i just switched from gpt3 turbo to gpt4 o and gpt4 turbo to gpt4 o and then price dropped again 50 percent then latency dropped again 50 percent mm. uh, otherwise you know all these things look at it ahead in time both from latency perspective, price dropping perspective, technological feature perspective, think that this multimodal feature will become better in six months and release it now. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't per perform up to the expectations, but you would have had SEO built, search engine optimization built for that feature mm -hmm. if you had launched six months earlier. Now people search for it and they land on your landing page. But previously you were on GPT-3 Turbo. Now you have GPT-4 O, and it makes world of difference on how the exact same feature is implemented. So basically these are the things. Premature optimization for cost, latency, and yeah, tech, tech debt as well, not accumulating tech debt. Super interesting. And I think our last point you made about using your previous discoverability to continue making progress, but now you have an upgraded um, sort of feature set because the underlying model right. has increased. So coming back to that, okay, maybe that is your moat, your discoverability versus everyone is hitting sort of the same API, right? You get the first, right. <laughs> you basically get the first calls to the API versus someone else. That's a good, um, that's a good distinction. How are you thinking about open source models? I won't say versus, but open source models and I like to call them big box APIs. Yeah. I think uh, when it comes to enterprises and private deployments, etc., open mm -hmm. source models are the way to go. Uh, even for companies that want don't, don't want to send any other data outside, etc. Mm. But uh, without any bias, speaking as a microsas builder who is building B2C, I think for me, these closed source APIs have uh, made my life a lot easier because 
I have seen the painful process of dockerizing with GPU, my own T5 model, finding players who can host it, host it even serverlessly back then. Mm -hmm. They asked me to take the full GPU and host it. So $300, $400, mm -hmm. not scalable API even. So quite a lot of challenges. And my life became incrementally uh, easier once the you know, closed models offered as API have come out. And uh, now my iteration speed, uh, all these things are directly correlated to how fast those APIs are moving. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm one of the, one of the biggest ones who benefited from these APIs uh, just from uh, purely execution perspective mm -hmm. times uh, you know, cutting down my ml ops work cutting down my costs and all this uh, but i know the game of open source pretty well because we built models recently for indic model indic languages as well on google's Gemma. we got featured in google io as well mm -hmm. 2024 and that is to cater for the kind of researcher in me in the sense that I really want to not just be the money making guy with AI, like not just build AI SaaS for, uh, for the sake of it and make money. That's part of the game. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, like I mentioned previously, your influence, the real influence is when people at the top of their game respect you. Yes. That's the highest form of intelligence. Mm -hmm. You can just show new AI app that came out every day on Instagram and get to 100,000 or even 1 million followers. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you have a shallow level of influence over everybody. No one revers you. No one admires you. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that kind of influence myself. I see. If I ever wanted to be in that position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My first goal is to find the, you know, the high, the people highest in the game should have respect for you. Yes. Then that's a real top down influence. Mm. Everything else, that's the pyramid top down influence, which is the highest form of reverence or whatever influence you can have in the world. Uh, otherwise, at one day or the other, you will be branded pseudo influencer if you can't answer basics in whatever field you claim to be an influencer. Mm -hmm. And the internet is uh, rough. Mm. It doesn't matter if you have uh, 100 great comments, one guy will come and say, this guy don't know a thing. And that haunts you for the days that makes you lose sleep. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if... Uh, if you're okay with that, that's fine. Otherwise, if you consciously choose not to play in that part, start with the reverse. Yes. Have the highest reverence from the top influ top people in whatever you're doing mm -hmm. and then go top down from the pyramid. Yeah. Yep. Talk to me about your, you know, that recent work that you did with a colleague of yours, you know, training an index model. Um, why, why did you guys decide right. to do that? And well, you know, how did you end up getting featured in Google? And what has that done now for your, I'm learning your top-down influence? <laughs> Absolutely. So six months back, I was just playing with the tokenizer of Llama mm -hmm. when it came out, Llama 2. Uh, I just trained the tokenizer on uh, Telugu language, the language that I speak, one of the Indian language. And I just posted it online. So nothing fancy, no model trained and the tokenizer is trained, but unless the tokenizer is trained on data, it's not usable. Right? Mm -hmm. Anyways, but media is ahead of time. Someone picked up uh, in the media, they wrote an article right, that uh, people are working on Indic, for Telugu, Ramsey is working on building Telugu Indic models. For Hindi, there's something. So they featured me and uh, Few people reached out to me, some congratulated, great, great work, uh, love to see what you're up next. Then there's this friend of mine, Ravi, whom we have been in, in con I mean, 
we only met online in the last one and a year just through just like you and me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he reached out and saying where are you with these models i would like to contribute if i can mm. and i told him are you not aware of how indian media works <laughs> if you are asking this question <laughs> it's a bloated up thing where i just put some tokenizer now i am you like you know, the guy. thrown into model building but anyways i'll take it mm-hmm. it's it's pr that i am working on indic models for telugu language yes. so i'll take it i jokingly said to him and i said okay do you have any serious interest and i have this personal experience 100 people reach out to you 99 people will drop out when you give them a task the task could be simply like just write me a summary of what do you want to do and i just gave a similar homework to him of course he is in the same technical cadre on me yeah. cadre as me mm-hmm. not just not that he is like an intern level or not he is like well paid technical but just to i i take a very safe bet which is whenever people enthusiastically reach out i tell them you do great work if i have bandwidth or time i'll just give some uh, some perspective to it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, some perspective to it you don't need to publish it as our work even you have your name you brand it if you write a paper it is going to be on your name everything so i i don't even try, try to take any credit from them mm. for the little work that i do uh, i started the same way and uh, fortunately or unfortunately he was getting more and more enthusiastic and started building data sets uh, you know playing with models libraries things like that and it became like an everyday conversation for us oh, so, okay what are we working on next then once that threshold passed got passed where he is really focused on building it mm-hmm. uh, i was naturally drawn into it with equal efforts with him yes and uh, we uh, we just started the work first for telugu language then newer models came out we were one of the first ones to test out the models the tokenizers so we could move incredibly fast because um we were just two individuals building on top of it mm-hmm. we could switch the models overnight we could train the models with a little compute and try it out whereas for a research organization it's a little hard because they have to convince the whole team to take that research direction mm. just strategically speaking so we could iterate mm. incredibly fast so we moved on from llama 2 to jama jama mm. we collect and there was lot of work done for llama 2 mm-hmm. uh, for individual languages okay in india mm-hmm. and we collected all the data that was done for individual languages in india trained one model fine tuned one model for 15 indian languages and uh, we released it navarasa that's we called it as navarasa and released it and uh, luckily all this work you know none of it is paid for the recognition is not guaranteed the compute and translation cost was also somewhat borne by us Uh, literally there is no incentive it's like a you know uh, wild grown mushroom until it flourishes no one wants it to flourish <laughs> there's <laughs> horse tramping on it there's someone rat running around there are every possible options to make it die but still if it survives then it is really wild grown mushroom that has the caliber right mm-hmm. so this project was just like that it was burning our own money time no direct uh, promised uh, respect or recognition at all mm-hmm. nothing is promised right of course. of course at least if you are a research lab then there are pr waiting for you if you publish something that those newspapers will pick it up or the investors will tell the newspapers that we have done this from this company etc so none of this was there so when you when you don't know the metric of what to do you just run at your full speed mm. and suddenly you put that horse in a horse track it has blinders about what other people are what other horses are doing are, are doing and once you start the game 
if it came out the fastest horse in the game uh, it's just out of ignorance that yeah, you know just like that randomly serendipity hit us ravi wrote a blog we we wrote content everywhere on linkedin twitter we we were getting decent amount of likes from just individual uh, enthusiasts a enthusiasts and uh, ravi wrote a blog on medium google team found out about us mm-hmm. they reached out to us uh, they initially asked us to find uh, i mean just i know audience are listening and it's a public thing but i'll just make a jibe at uh, things so they asked us to find uh, use cases for this uh, then we are like uh, isn't it your job as product managers in google to do that why are you asking to do that we are developers <laughs> and we went a little back and forth um, funnily then they were constantly asking what are the use cases of this we were like we built it for fun and if there are any use cases it's about it's it's upon you to find out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> we were like in that kind of uh, tone but later we realized that they want to showcase our work mm-hmm. that's why they are asking these questions uh, then one all of a sudden they tell uh, can you fly to mysore which is like Three hours away from Bangalore. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you fly to Mysore on these dates? And uh, we were uh, we were like very adamant in the sense that we don't want uh, other people to dictate anything right, for us. Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, asking our time because we were doing it for fun. Now, without any incentive, you are asking us to do extra work, whether it is finding problems and other things. but uh, let's be honest since it was google we entertained if it was any other company we wouldn't have <laughs> and uh, suddenly they mentioned that uh, you know if everything goes well we'll feature in google io and uh, they have flown us there it was like a proper movie setup with four or five rigs mm. uh, four almost four teams camera crew what flown from one from uh, i think us california the base team one from uk some production team camera team then one from bombay then again one from local mysore or bangalore so there were like 80 people and uh, we thought you know we are not in movies to get this kind of uh, you know 80 people working for us for two days in uh, nicely posh four star hotel booked for us we are never going to make that in movies at this age at 35 mm. uh, and there's no for that so let's enjoy the you know enjoy the short lived uh, thing and uh, we went whatever they asked us to do we talked and uh, it was like a two and a half hour conversation they were asking all kind of questions to me and uh, we were aware that this two and a half hours would be cut down to 10 seconds yes in the end mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. what happened to me uh but unfortunately ravi wasn't aware that it would be cut down to 0 seconds mm. so he was disappointed yes. so that yes. none of his footage was there mm-hmm. um but he, uh i mean in the end uh, we got good recognition i think uh, one recognition that i would say is uh i moved out of silicon valley in 2018 at the peak of my career not that my visa has expired not that my job was not doing well i had even green card i140 filing etc done wow. was, like wow. life was great life was i i mean hmm. i mean i don't like to mention it because it's overrated but i had a porsche panamera with my number plate ram city <laughs> california life was and uh, with stocks etc i was making 180k back in 20 185k hmm. life was uh, brilliant from everyone's perspective my mom and dad my friends single guy has 330 horsepower car mm. whatever 600 uh, i mean 600 cc motorcycle uh, goes to so- south africa spends 5000 dollars on vacations luxury vacations for a week life was sorted uh, but i announced to my friends this is one thing that i did i think i did right mm-hmm. which is I never ask people about what should I do next or I am taking this decision what's your opinion mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just inform them uh, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunate so I told my friends like the phd friends that I mentioned they are still in california working for research labs and my school college friends etc 
in in a dinner meeting i told them moving to bangalore uh, sorry moving to india hometown hyderabad uh, in 3 weeks uh, they said are you going to get married that's the question they asked no 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 i am telling i am moving for good forever to then they asked did you get fired <laughs> uh, no uh i just informed my manager that uh, so just like a little diversion yeah, yeah, yeah. just for fun mm. uh, so i used to be uh, almost 2 to 3 months away from us while as an employee uh, on this trip or my home country trip etc etc and technically we had i had only 12 leaves if you know in america Uh, when you start out you have 12 official calendar leaves mm-hmm. then my coworkers used to joke how is this guy out of the country for 3 months right uh, when you have 12 stipulated holidays so in the last trip when i went and i came back my manager called me in with vp of engineering put us in a cabin me vp of engineering manager so the ultimatum was this uh no more leaves uh no more unpaid ho- or paid holidays for you mm. you have to take it on only stipulated time wow i said fair enough uh, fair enough uh, it's the company's policy nothing to do with it i will never be in a position to ask for leave ever again i will never put myself in in that position again mm. and uh, multiple factors a was picking up i finished pretty much every nano, nano degree that came on udacity at that point of time mm-hmm. yeah, pretty much every popular course on deep learning or what uh, coursera so i could foresee where ai was exactly going i mean at least theoretically from the courses and uh, i was living this lifestyle which fortunately i was mm-hmm. like i was living life in reverse if you never did the highest form of thing you always want to shorten that path mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you the ideal thing you know the best thing to do is when you re- retire in california with 1 million dollars spend 250k on a porsche whatever panamera and drive that at 60 retire in california i reverse that equation mm. uh, so there is no more longing for me to achieve any highest form of financial achievement or anything like that i have seen it fortunately mm-hmm. so i it was an easy decision for me to just let it go let go of everything right and i what people call uh, careful move i moved to india with uh, zero dollars i didn't save up anything uh, nothing and i moved actually i wanted to move with zero dollars but i thought why don't i move with 20000 dollars in debt us debt <laughs> that's even better right <laughs> so i did the unthinkable which is my father has never flown out of the country so i flew him in business class in and out first time out of the country now he is flying in business class in and out emirates or etihad mm. i don't remember uh Bellagio stay Las Vegas uh every time where my Porsche could go I took him in Porsche if he if we flew if we have flown off to longer places like Los Angeles etc rented like a Jaguar F type etc <laughs> I have shown him that he is he stayed only for one week I told him this is a surprise here dad this is USA the best money could buy in mm. USA now the little surprise for you is i am moving away from usa forever for good <laughs> <laughs> and he was like okay i mean did you take it like a calculated decision and everything i said yes it's there's no going back i took deliberately mm. and that's how i moved back and i have to really apologize i lost track of the first question no this is good this that you no i i think this is good because <laughs> you and i are both technically immigrants you're no longer an immigrant you're back in your home country and for a lot of us who live on the outside you went to school as an international student that's not an easy thing um 
especially when your family has to pony up all that money in a lower currency to get you that opportunity to go there. And then once you're there, you're expected to, you know, be that, uh, what you call it, you'd be the anchor and, and to sort of create that bridge, right? For technically more prosperity, just because there's a higher currency value. And, and to see you give up all of that, I, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, I, I would say one, one more key aspect. Mm-hmm. One biggest aspect, I think the biggest worry for my parents was not money or losing job. When you are 28 and you are making your salary to zero and you're single, mm. what are you going to do with your marriage prospects? Mm. When it's about time to get married, 28 to 30. What do we say to the girl to even dupe her? At least now you have zero salary. Mm. You are not, you don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> At least even you should have a basis to dupe somebody, right? Not literally yes, duping, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just joking. Uh, I'm like, we'll figure it out. Uh, like, we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, at least I was uh, fine that, you know, in India, you can survive with $500. I mm-hmm. live with my parents. At the time, I lived with my parents. Yes. So when you hit, when you come again to the bottom, there's not much. And uh, main thing is that I, I had like incredible uh, confidence in my skills though. Mm. That was one thing that, uh, I mean, it sounds like boasting, but the thing is that I have done so many, so many courses. I have gone to a lot of entrepreneurship events, even in when I was in Silicon Valley. So I've seen a lot of, and I've traveled before moving back itself. I traveled probably like 10 countries or so now probably 17 18 countries so i had a strong understanding of the just like how the techno tectonic shifts were uh, happened from mesopotamia all those how africa got separated Mm -hmm. like i had the high level overview of where the world is kind of going ahead at least Mm -hmm. and i was just like a blind hope that i am poised to at least be a small fraction of the growth curve, uh, whether it is profitability or innovation. Hmm. I mean, no, no massive success yet, but just the blind faith the back then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The plunge. The- so this is, yeah. this is here's an interesting question. <laughs> I think a lot of people hope to go to Silicon Valley. A lot of people will never get there. Um, yeah. For instance, I've, I went to school in Florida from 2006. I'm still there. Mm-hmm. I've never <laughs> actively worked in Silicon Valley. I work remotely for NVIDIA. Uh, fortunately, blessed, blessed to say that, uh, in Florida. And I've always wondered, what am I missing by not being in the Bay? Because it, it does seem that there's an acceleration. And, and one thing I did... One thing I did learn and appreciate, at least when I visited Stanford, was that, and I think you have it, is that the underlying, excuse me, how should I say this? <clears throat> Freshmen, their base expectation of what was possible was, was way up here. Completely. Right. It, it was insane. Versus where someone who was tenured, who was not in that region, their prospects of belief of what was possible was way, way lower. That's one thing that I, I noticed as a sort of core that's really stuck out to me when I, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to go out right. there back and forth over the times, but what's your thoughts on, okay, if you don't live in Silicon Valley, you never, you may not ever be able to go there anytime soon. Well, what, what can you take away from it? Hmm. So I think there are a few undeniable things. One is the innovation, the money, uh, everything. The, that's the highest pro where you go to a hackathon and meet incredibly high-paced talent and you can create companies along with them or work for any of these companies at the cusp of innovation. Absolutely undeniably that innovation and uh, that aspect is always there. 
uh, for me i i did see that like viscerally i experienced that either going to these high end tech talks uh, all these uh, hackathons etc um but for me i felt a little bit like you know traveling and you know also coming from indian background everything it felt like a bubble or let's call it a simulation <laughs> now whatever <laughs> game you are playing if if you have internalized it as a simulation that means if you are in, in, involved in a game let's say a card nfs for speed whatever it is at one point you want to turn it off and come back to reality hmm and for me it's not for everybody most people are still in that and they want to make it big yes. for me it felt like the same way why don't i you know come back to reality which is there is never ending cusp of innovation making it big etc one is do you really want to be in that game for me the question was never about being that billion dollar ceo standing on the stage getting applauded not it didn't appeal to me as much mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, i was happy do my stuff make some fame here and there if you can that's okay uh, be more free live enjoy the world uh, do some innovation i mean innovation is kind of i would say it's like the japanese or japanese thing right ikigai yes where you do it without the money i think the people's longevity the most important thing like if you see uh, documentaries is the longevity of people is based on the how many years they live it's based on if they found a passion that is irrespective of money etc that they can do when without retirement and all these mm-hmm. things right mm-hmm. for me innovation and other things are similar where i love to be in this field do something interesting great but i am like a one who continuously experiments and i don't need to have direct roi in terms of monetary things for me so and the other thing was tra- banking on these trends right you have remote work you have fractional operations you have all the patterns evolving consumer patterns of how they buy things spend things and how the economy is shifting the disposable income of a uh, growing economy like india mm-hmm. you kind of when you track all of these things you can see through with some lens that you can find your sweet spot even in india mm-hmm. and um let me put it this way i am a little bit far but not way too off from let's say making quarter million 250k usd uh, a year mm-hmm. sitting in india oh that's uh, nice let's call let that's me clean. See, if you factor in <laughs> i mean i mean if you factor in the on and off consulting that i get sure sure if you extrapolate that consulting for the whole year mm-hmm. that coupled with my saas income mm. it's not too way off and my thought process is sure maybe top if you want to make it to the top 0.001% of the world mm. live in california us but if you prioritize your freedom your well being uh, you want to be in a, in your happy place at the same time if you are in 10 less top 0.01% mm-hmm. the not bad right it's still a good uh, value prop for you yeah and i thought stay remote build uh, globally competing companies uh, and that process has significantly en- improved in myself internalized by that i mean previously i thought one person sitting in india building an ai company they cannot build globally ai companies competing with silicon valley mm-hmm. team mm-hmm. now i think that fundamental premise of even mine i have negated it myself with two things one is if i upskill myself enough which i have done mm-hmm. i know every framework 
open ai api is the same for me or a hacker in silicon valley pretty much the same mm-hmm. i stand on the brink of innovation so i know the curve and people in silicon valley know the same and la- last thing is ai as exoskeleton if i am able to use tools like github copilot cursor.ai and ask for a feature get it push it to production in the next one hour and even the best engineers if they are wait if they code it in 5 minutes but wait for a pr to be merged and a tester to be tested next week i can beat 100 member team the most innovative team in the game you should pick the game i cannot pick the game in a 11 member football team mm-hmm. but if i have mastered table tennis it doesn't matter if you are a table tennis player and coming on to the table uh, fighting along with me i mean playing along with me yeah. it doesn't matter if you have been trained with 100 different coaches all over the world i know there is a limited throughput your mind can take and what you can execute on the table playing table tennis mm, in that moment if i can mm. match in that moment if i can match the throughput and even better beat it because i have less latency because my i am not listening to any trainer the for example in saas the web designer the tester the the one who is looking at customer support the one developer everything is integrated into one loop that is in my brain mm. if i choose the game such it doesn't matter if you are a table tennis player trained with 100 different coaches it doesn't matter because you are processing how to best execute the 100 different coaches and play the next move whereas i am internally trained to beat in this space in this confined space i know the game extremely well It, and i looked at as as the same way and today both saas apps that i built ai meme generator super meme and question i i internally think it is the best app in the world for doing ai memes it is the the best app in the world for doing ai quizzes if someone is going to beat that they are going going to beat that with gpt5 but i am going to implement gpt5 the moment the api comes before the pr gets burst by the manager and that is my real real big moat mm. which is if you have a narrow passage and you are asked to run from a to b and it's a single player game doesn't matter if you have vcs cheering for you doesn't matter all you need to think is that if you are the well trained athlete to run in that narrow passage from a to b no amount of funding innovation all those things etc they could out compete you even if they do with a slight margin but you are on the top of the game top of the world pretty much uh, I, i look at everything that i do the same way and i mean just to quote one thing all my teenage years of course why i was less mature was were filled with uh, sadness that if you can't be the best in the game what is the point of playing that game mm. uh, i mean sur- beyond survival if you need money for survival great but beyond that once your survival is set what's the fun in playing a game when you are not best in the game best in the world Uh, just another hundred thousandth member on the game. Then I realized you don't need to play the game of life. You need to miniaturize the game for yourself, where you are. You can be the best player in that game in the world, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So you need to change the game, change the rules of the game, design the game such. And all my, I would say, youth sadness is compensated. by picking games where i can play the best yes now a meme generator i know no one can build it better than us even if they do it's a just slight margin pretty much we are there mm-hmm. and that's how i look at it yeah wow that that was i took a lot away um do you have more time 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> technically you own your time. Do, so. do, do the listeners have more time to <laughs> hear through the two-hour podcast? <laughs> well, to be honest, here's an interesting thing about that as well. So you talk about choosing miniature games and playing games. And, and I think for me, this podcast is a good reflection of that because I think, so that picture I have behind me, um, I got an NFT unofficial recap. PhD, so NFT recap. So I, I like to study games like yourself on markets and, and who are the players that are, have these outsized advantages. So in the NFT game, the people who were making the money were the influencers because they could get the price at the lowest, shill it, pump it, dump it off on everyone else. So I thought I could do the same, thought I could be an NFT influencer. That's how I learned YouTube. So it was a proxy sort of for my learning. And the way that I was measuring was the amount of you know, followers. But then I realized, hey, I should just focus on AI and leave that to the high schoolers. They'll, they'll look better at that than I was. Um, and even my podcast, as I think about, I'm also treating this podcast almost like a micro SaaS because there are these dominant podcasts. I, I love them. I, I ain't seen no Caribbean people. Uh, that, that was kind of like my hope where uh, you have Tim Ferriss, you have, uh, I follow all these personal development, Diary of CEO, all those people. I was like, you know, they have nobody from the Caribbean that have a Caribbean accent that, you know, talking the same <laughs> shit that they're talking, you understand what I said? And I was like, wow, what if I could, what if I could do that? Right. And, and I think right. I initially started off measuring to their standard and to their number of followers, et cetera, et cetera. And in interviewing so many people that I've interviewed so far, I've, I've learned that there's some folks who did podcasts you know, like Sanyam Bhutani uh, from, who was from right. Fast AI. He did 140 something episodes right. and he stopped. Right. Harpreet Sohota, he had, he had Robert Green. He stopped. And, and all of these people, actually mm-hmm. most of them stopped to kind of focus on their core technical skill. So even coming back to sort of why I raised this point, this micro SaaS approach where I'm playing a very different game. I don't care if this thing has a huge number of followers, but can I find those hundred people that align with me really, really well, right? And at the end of the day, if, if Ramsey had a good time on my podcast, great, I've won. <laughs> that, that's the game that I'm, I'm now playing. And, Amazing. And, and to round that out, you know, you talk a lot about freedom. You talked about yeah. having your Porsche, flying your dad, et cetera, et cetera. And, and to some degree, all of us will, will sort of face that day when you're done. That's, that's the final day. And, and just keeping in that reflection about which game are you playing for that sort of end day, I think is, is super important. Right. Absolutely. You seem extremely philosophical for the most part. <laughs> and oh, I, I, at least I've, I've picked up those those tones. Have you read this book called The Company of One? Mm, no. Uh, I mean, I've heard about that book. Okay, okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't read a lot of books. Mm. For some reason, uh, you know, beyond three, four pages, it, <laughs> I lose uh, uh, attention. And second thing is that I think... Uh, there is timeless wisdom mm. for sure those books are help yeah then there is an evolving cusp of changes if you are working on the evolving cusp of changes mm-hmm. no one has a clue yeah the only one uh, only if you are a broad general uh, generalist and like i said you have a bird's eye view you have the best finite mathematical estimation of the next step. Mm. That's it. Mm-hmm. And I think no one cuts that mark if you are already in pretty much the top of the game. So that's one of the reasons, at least for, you know, micro SaaS building things, all those things as things are evolving. I've I've not actively looked at uh, gaining wisdom from other sources that are available. Of course, there's transient wisdom in YouTube videos, podcasts, like what you're doing. Mm. I pick up here and there once in a while. Yeah. But you're learning, uh, but, but please go but ahead, you're sorry. learning in the game itself by playing the game, you're learning and, and exactly. exposing exactly. new worlds in that game. Um, yeah. The reason why I bring out that book is because you embody that ethos. 
So the company of one's premise is uh, the real success is, let's say, you know, a million dollar micro SaaS business, just you, no employees. And after I read that book, because I was very much jaded with the, yeah, I'm going to be a Silicon Valley CEO and da, 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 and, and, and I, I think in going to Silicon Valley, you, you see quality of life, very different, you know, different people enjoy their work to different degrees. Um, and I, I, I've seen a different type of game. I've spent time with VCs. So now I see, you know, how that game is sort of architected for certain folks to win. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, so I become very, became very enchanted with the sort of company of one idea. And then that's why I really locked on to you. I'm like, this dude, this dude be living the company of <laughs> one pretty clean. So I, I need to pay attention, you know? Um, <laughs> here's something interesting. So you were number one on product hunt. You were able to do that. Um, talk to us about that piece of the journey, right? I think most folks know about product hunt, but you know, you listed that from, an, from India, correct? When you, were, when you did it. Yeah. So talk, walk us yeah. through that product hunt journey. Sure. So I think the, one of the area premise we need to understand before on product hunt is I think there are two ways to really win the game. Okay. One is you are influential already. You mm. have massive following. You launch a decently working app mm -hmm. or even mediocre app to some extent. Your following timed well will amplify it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Second aspect is actually exactly riding the wave the moment you need to be ready with the surfboard the moment tide hits you mm. so that you ride the wave exactly at the highest acceleration possible that's formed by the high uh, you know top moving mm -hmm. wave mm -hmm. and this is pretty much what i always look at when i try to time my products i see uh, and super meme was one such mm. and uh, and without following if you want to really really hit it big it is ab about riding on the m multitude riding on multitude technologies and not just technology but rather even the trends mm -hmm. whether it is marketing trends or consumer behavior trends and all these things yes and uh, uh, what happened with super meme and at the right time was prior to that there were this huge influx of companies like copy.ai jasper that were like text to copy you paste in some text uh, then you get a marketing copy facebook ad and all these things so we thought about this idea where can you extend it to slightly different modalities so this there is this wave of companies that made money copy.ai jasper and now can you extend that a little more uh, into multiple modalities that is introducing images even mm. and uh, second uh, thing that i always believe is there is the highest form of uh, gameplay the gameplay is you should on the outer layer, do what everyone understands. And on the inner layer, do what no one can do. Ooh. That gives you the highest form of leverage. Mm. That means, uh, just I take this example of movies all the time. If you really want to build a blockbuster, you already cut down on one and one genre. Go and build an action movie, period. It is not about you building a romantic thriller, uh, horror movie, nothing. If you just take data scientist, every single highest grossing movie on the list is action. Mm -hmm. Pretty much action mm -hmm. adventure, however you want to call it. What does that mean? Simply means that has the highest target audience. That means you fundamentally want to play the game big, 
there is proven proven over time the highest number of people roi for it is action mm-hmm. similarly take it to saas or anything in entrepreneurship the highest form is entertainment and entertainment has one interesting thing it takes very lower cognition to mm. consume it mm. so my bar is if you really launch an app or idea that idea should have very lowest con- cognition to consume it mm-hmm. then you have the highest highest uh, our, uh, target audience for it yeah but it should have the highest cognition to build it mm. on the reverse yep so if you really understand multi model and know that ai can do sarcasm mm-hmm. then you can build the ai meme generator mm-hmm. emulate what humans were doing sarcastically humor with memes mm-hmm. so lowest con- cognition to consume it on the uh, outer layer highest cognition to build it mm-hmm. on the inner layer yes. this is the magical formula of looking at copy.ai success jasper success and uh, i wanted to do something on this magical formula mm-hmm. because i did question <clears throat> question has a very very long process of 4 years and i got to 100k audience literally zero marketing no influencer mentions question because it is a purely a tech app so no virality in any sense mm-hmm. but why don't i engineer engineer this magical formula highest con- cognition to build it lowest cognition to consume it this is the magical formula for massive virality and we saw memes ai generated memes was the right target for this and uh, tested out on collab google collab things worked well okay now ai can really be sarcastic not not a joke anymore and um, coupled it with memes and i have something working then found great team who can mm-hmm. build all equal partners we have never met in real life even today really wow <clears throat> yeah we got to 700k users I, i mean users might fear that we have never met that yet but it is what it is um and you know timing so when you build with the right ai technology and like i mentioned if you don't have an audience you need to have a magical idea that's at the intersection of two technical as well as behavioral intersection mm-hmm. of how the world is evolving or consuming and <clears throat> on the outside it looks very normal but again like i mentioned there is an extrapolation which is my generation hasn't grown up that much with memes okay uh, mm-hmm. when i mean i am born in 1989 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so memes came in a little later all these things but there is a really underlying thought in building super meme which is the next generation to me grew up with memes snapchat mhm now that was 10 15 years back when they were in their <clears throat> you know just graduating etc when they become the dominant workforce that means when they are in the 35 to 40 30 to 40 age era mm-hmm. which is right now they will be the main stakeholders in everything either purchase decisions they'll be the middle managers in everything and all these things so they have grown up with memes and it's a fundamental part of their dna mm-hmm. memes snap snapchat now they have grown come into workforce which is a pretty predominant 30 to 40 age layer now is the right time to whatever build something with memes do marketing with memes memes and marketing can come into mainstream mm-hmm. my generation might even look at it with a lens of being cheesy corny etc mm-hmm. whereas the generation next to me will still look at it professionally attached because they have their dna in their dna they have memes and uh, snapchat kind of behavior mm-hmm. that's our, another insight yes so we thought it it shouldn't just be just like a fun app it can actually be 
the most dominant channel for marketing for B2B businesses or companies even. Mm. Because now we have this 30 to 40 age layer whose DNA is already embedded with memes and culturally associating with itself, detaching their professional and personal thing Mm -hmm. where memes can now Mm -hmm. even be part of professional life, not just uh, for fun, for kids. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Memes memes are very special. So I I like to, I don't want to say dissect that is, but I like to, you know, we're doing inference. We're going to generalize this, this particular thought. So some things I heard from you were choose an idea that has a very, to some degree, low mental cognition barrier to adopt or to interact with that particular service. Next, it should also have a very high cognition barrier to build. So you you get one moat on the billing side. Um, you've talked about the moat in terms of uh, hopefully you architect the game such that there are narrow pathways that you need to go through. So you as a single little tiny robot can get through, but a big ship has to go you know, all the way around the continent in order to, to get to the same destination or similar destination. Um, how do you now generalize that to something that has a high cognition barrier, but it has a, a much higher value, for instance, like enterprise software. There's a, there's a higher cognition barrier to maybe use it. What's your thoughts there? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I really love enterprise for the money in the sense that when something is harder to get, it is harder to lose. And again, Mm. I will mention one user behavior that's only reality now than it was 10 years ago. The user behavior is that, you know, my, whatever, my 35, I am 35 and my age, we were used to one enterprise software or even just software like Microsoft or whatever you are paying for it. Mm -hmm. You pay once and that's it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like, competitor emerging and you switching both from mental layer as well as the payments infra layer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we are living in a different era where you can create a separate credit card for that one subscription, like a quick digital credit card. Mm -hmm. So that means on the infra layer, you have advanced payments, you know, focused subscriptions, everything chargebacks and all all the game, the whole game has changed. Second thing is that on the user behavior in the sense that previously a credit card used to be something that's kept in the wallet, rarely taken out for paying this subscription software. That's it. Unless it gives up on you, you don't cancel it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, generation today is different because there are multiple things here. Even the UI UX layer, they have adopted mentally to the popular UI UX that are out there. Mm -hmm. So there are only four, five, six popular UI UX patterns out there predominantly. So for them, a new app is not another learning curve. Mm -hmm. It's just mapping to another UI UX pattern that they have seen over millions of apps. What does that mean? Now they are not mentally wired to go through a learning curve. Mm -hmm. They just cancel the subscription, cancel copy.ai and buy jasper.ai in 10 seconds. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They have that mental switching behavior inbuilt from both mental layer because there is no learning learning curve because UI UX has progressed so much that they made it intuitive to the current generation. Yes. Zero learning curve. And... uh, Zero affinity towards, you know, layer towards data, etc. Because if it's a personal app, pretty much there's nothing critical there usually, or you can download, export things. So previously you could build a software, have some churn could be very less, probably two or three percent. Today churn could be as high as 30, 40%, 50% even for A apps. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with your inability to build the app. 
right it has only part to do with that and a bigger part is just how easy for someone to cancel a credit card subscription get a new issue a new digital credit card within seconds and how their ui ux patterns of adapting to a new uh, app has become there is zero learning curve pretty much mm. and they are used to you know tapping cards everywhere now you are operating in a different land altogether people switch within one minute from this app to next mm-hmm. and it doesn't have anything to do with you so w- this context is to establish that b2c as we know it as we know it from five years ago is not the same anymore mm-hmm. because of these two evolving behaviors right with ai as well as user behavior b2b is a place where still things are the same because there is a stakeholder layer escalation layer when it has gone through the approval then you ask the accounting team to purchase this software once the software is integrated <clears throat> they are not going to switch the software again for the next 6 months one year whatever period of time until there is a critical break uh, in their flow mm-hmm. so if something is harder to get it is harder to lose and that is the truth with b2b b2c is not the same right. so if you want to really build long term sustainable uh, somewhat of a defensible companies even to a disruption i would say b2b is perfect segue to go and build now there are few key aspects b2b again stands for trust security all these things so if you are in building in b2b it is not helpful if you say you are a single solopreneur building this mm. trust is not established mm-hmm. are you backed by somebody do you have 10 members in the team do you have soc soc compliance this compliance that compliance have you gone through this compliance that takes $10000 to get complied they will go through your process so still the game like i mentioned pick the game mm-hmm. if that game is not for you don't play that game uh, and if you want to really build like i mentioned 5 to 7 year sustainable long term generational wealth companies vc backed multi million dollars still b2b is a source to go yes harder to lose harder to get uh and in that sense i have highest respect uh for b2b founders doing there and b2b builders <clears throat> and uh yeah as a vc if if i am working for a company i feel great if they are a b2b company uh i feel that i am not going to get fired that easily mm-hmm. uh so mm-hmm. as an employee lot of lot of uh, you know comfort in working with b2b companies and uh, inherently there's this these layers that are there which makes it harder to just lose revenue mm-hmm. through churn or disruption by ai etc what are what are three common mistakes you see people make when they go to build let's focus on microsas since you're an expert they all use us just in general hmm. three points mm. i think first thing is picking an outdated idea or even timed idea as of today mm-hmm. doesn't matter if the world is moving towards spotify doesn't matter if you have a 100 million dollar business in cds today it's a dwindling business and i will tell you how many times i see and say it's a dwindling business basically the tagline is i that, that i put is don't operate in dwindling business mm. it doesn't matter if you are making profit doesn't matter if there is huge amount of money tech is going to erase that over time it's an exponent decaying exponent mm-hmm. you are on that curve get out of that that's one yes dwindling business second thing is uh, like i mentioned build your systems for 2 to 3 years ahead in time <clears throat> that comes in two parts technological layer two is 
basically hiring and other stuff. Keep your burn low uh, because AI can argument a lot of things. So uh, you probably don't need a full-time X, full-time Y, full-time Z employees. Have them part-time. <clears throat> Tomorrow, if you want to uh, increase your runway or make more profit, that could be replaced by you know, some kind of agents, agentic workflow as things get cheaper and faster. So build for systems in 2035. That's what I would say. Mm. Build, think 10 years ahead and build 10 year system today. And it might look like, uh, <clears throat> it might look like uh, it's not optimized, it's not timed well, it's costly, it's high latency, etc. But if you have the forearching vision uh, of how things are going to go, build for the next five years timeline. That's one. Then third point is understand the monetizable window of every technology, every landscape that you're working on. Everything has a monetizable window. Um, copy.ai, one and a half years. Doesn't matter if mm. they get to 12 million ARR. No. Today, text in, text out is a uh, standard thing that's from chat GPT, et cetera, that it becomes trivial. That becomes trivial, not just through offerings, but even user behavior patterns. Now they are okay we, okay to go to chat GPT, type it out to get the text back. And user behavior patterns is something that I think most people overlook. Mm. They just think about technological evolution. They don't think about changing user behaviors like I mentioned, um, quick commerce, 10 minute grocery delivery, etc. eating into e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Basically, a 10 minute delivery startup eating into Amazon's profits. That was not expected. They think they are going to just eat small grocery stores that are there. Mm -hmm. But no, if you can deliver, uh, let's say, razor in 10 minutes and all the, the even a t-shirt in 10 minutes you're competing with amazon but you are operating not as a direct competitor to amazon but like uh, just coming under the carpet just like water mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you are deluged some submerged before you know it yes and understand these changing user behaviors that is extremely important both technological behaviors and uh, what I mean by that is I don't belong to the next generation of me but it is very very easy to observe what they are spending their most time in mm -hmm. what are their mental patterns in how they are interacting with others basically three things individually how are they entertaining themselves how, how do they spend time themselves mm -hmm. as an individual how do i spend time with the society that means with their peers how are they communicating what is that communication transaction length that means are they doing voice calls are they doing chatting are they doing whatever format how is the transaction how are they interacting with the ecosystem that's the third thing mm -hmm. how are they banking how are they paying for stuff, uh, how are they spending, uh, how does the financial outlook look, they look like, how is their, how are their long-term decisions look like. Identify these three things on individual, peer-to-peer, -peer, that is societal level and ecosystem level on a broader level. Now take those patterns and extrapolate of how they would apply to SaaS in the next five to 10 years. That's the point number three. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, man, I'm loving this episode. So, uh, I have a couple <laughs> more questions to, to round it out. So sure. your gift is defined as something that comes easy to you, but is difficult to others. It doesn't have to make money. Um, what is your gift? My gift, uh, I think learning new things. Mm. I, I, I think uh, nothing beyond that. Because 
I, I, when a course comes in deep learning.ai, even at this stage on agents, uh, I can, one, without much effort, push myself cognitively to go through that cognitive overload and finish it, mm-hmm. even though it is complex. Uh, and there is a, I would say there's one fair advantage that I have, which is most of them are the- theoretical learners. And what they learn, unfortunately, cannot apply it to practical things because they might not be hands-on just from an operational perspective. Mm-hmm. But I have two SaaS apps. The good thing is that whatever I do in the agentic framework or anything that I newly learn in technology SaaS or even front-end frameworks, next years, I immediately connect that back into what feature or what user experience can it enhance in my app. Mm -hmm. And that closes a very, very important loop, which is escaping from the tutorial hell. You just go through tutorial after tutorial, tutorial after tutorial. You don't see the big picture. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I escaped that help and just loop. Yeah. I love that too, the tutorial hell. I've I've definitely been trapped in tutorial (laughs) hell at different points in my career. And it's painful. And it's interesting. One of the other reasons I wanted to do the interview was I think I've arrived near to that conclusion as well. Because sometimes when you don't have a production application to work on, you you don't ever really get to test the bounds and and see where things break and, and see how it contextually arrives inside of a product. So for me now, 100%. if I if I can't build a product out of it, I don't know it. That's how I'm trying to force my brain to think about things now versus, you know, even though at Absolutely. NVIDIA you get to do, you, you have to go super deep in order to sort of understand exactly what's happening under the hood, depending on what you're trying to do. So, but this has been, this has been interesting. Um, what would you say to someone who's having doubts about launching uh, micro SaaS app? Mm, I would take a more, more philosophical approach, which is understand the world before you build a SaaS. Uh, because to, to make 100K from an employer, you need to master a skill. Mm. 200, to make 100K from, from an app, you need to master the world. Ooh. That's my fundamental philosophy. <laughs> because wow. there's payments, there's user behavior, experience, user experience, there, there's technology, there's customer support. It is basically a microcosm of an economy. Mm-hmm. It's it's called micro SaaS on the outside, but it's a microcosm, microcosm of the economy where you identify gaps in your off in what you can build, map it with technology, price it rightly that people find value, Mm -hmm. offer enough customer support that they don't go to another competitor or feel valued and you file taxes and close the loop. (laughs) Yeah, I file in taxes one. (laughs) That one will get you. That's that's a real world shit. I I was I was thinking (laughs) about that too. You just oh that you wanna go take a real class in the world. You know, I guess that's that's interesting too. You know, even just going through the micro SaaS exercise as instead of going to university, like you just you go build one as that's your yeah. tuition money there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. On a technical level, quickly, mostly, you know, uh, payments, Stripe and others, subscriptions, mm-hmm. chargebacks, all those. Then there is authentication piece. Uh, then there is security mm-hmm. uh, and scaling, scaling yeah. things like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, and full stack application building, Next.js, mapping trends with technology, user experience. Yes. Uh, primarily, each one is a pocket in itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say one thing that my journey has been over these five years. So I had enough time to internalize some of these things it's not just about mastery of these things some you need to internalize them in your you know mind and body how they operate what is the fundamental of that thing and that's why i think it it's like a four or five year journey Mm. but it's like 
mostly about what's uh, commonplace to the world and what's common sense. Uh, looking back, every single thing looks like common sense, but it is about internalizing that common sense at the right point in to your brain and operating the future on based on that common sense mm-hmm. that's what it is mm-hmm. how is it what would you different what would you do differently now that chat gpt is here and you're at the start over today go what do what are you thinking <clears throat> bless you i mean um yeah thank you uh how i look at it is uh, this way at the end of the day you should be extremely sharp at mapping technology to a problem and if you cannot identify a problem pick a traditional problem but 10x or 100x that with technology mm. and as an ai person myself i really love on magical experiences that is ai should be at the forefront of delivering value it on the first <clears throat> usage <clears throat> the app should feel like magic to the end user mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, i constantly ask this question for myself what this new technology can enhance improve and make the experience 100x better and today if i am starting today and trying to build on what's existing out there two fundamentally two different things think about every problem problem in a multi model sense mm. any input and any output that means text image video audio output text image video audio take this fundamental layer probably apply it to different business verticals etc but think multi model from the ground up from the idea two is think ai agents from the ground up from the idea mm. simply you know people have multiple definitions about ai agents etc how i look at it is this way so far ai was trying to do what an individual expert could do a, write a good copy uh, edit a video uh, very very nicely or make youtube shorts from a long video etc what a single individual can do but there are a lot of tasks in the world that's a culmination of a team of human experts whether it's writing a detailed research report or it's doing an analyst job at bcg all these high end companies coming up with market research for a thing that uh, they are going to launch etc it's a culmination of multiple people's multiple experts job mm-hmm. and i think ai agents if you execute really well now you should simulate a team of human experts whatever they can accomplish in a month's time you can probably spawn agents and do that in you know one day or one hour if the speed improves mm-hmm. cost and latency improves and think in these two fundamental domains multi model and multi human experts Oh no, I I like that a lot. That's a nice nice distinction because naturally you would think okay, just replace this piece that piece, but the combination of pieces um that's an excellent call out. Uh, what so again closer to the end, what's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, a college student and a professional in that order? High schooler uh don't drop out. Mm. and it it matters where you drop out from from which height <laughs> so <laughs> that's super interesting okay okay that oh, that's that's gold man wow where i mean if you drop out from stanford great more people have visibility because it's a higher length mm. a lot of people can see you if you drop out from i if i drop out from this chair nobody is going to know it <laughs> or even care about it wow <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah but uh, yeah uh, so high school basically uh, focus as much as on your um, building your personal mental acumen as much as technology hmm. because 
so many people intelligence doesn't matter if you get onto the wrong track it's derailed i mean no one gives an award for the fastest car on the road on the track you will get rewarded mm-hmm. on the road it is about safely going from a to b it doesn't matter if you make the first 100 miles at you know 200 miles an hour, an hour but you break down and you cannot get to the destination mm. it doesn't matter at all so f- for high schooler i would say it is very very important to keep abreast with the technology as well as build your mental acumen mental strength to understand the world's way of things and be built mentally strong for the years ahead <clears throat> that is one strong advice and the second one was college college mm-hmm. college <clears throat> i will give the advice that i gave to myself the seniors don't know any better don't ask them advice <laughs> they are only one year the seniors are only one year ahead of you in ignorance that's it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is good. And a professional. Oh, I I got to hear this one. Professional <clears throat> um treat money as freedom to experiment. Leverage builds more leverage in this world predominantly. Mm. There are exceptions but don't bank on exceptions. You make 100k this year uh next one will offer 120k without evaluating you it doesn't matter if you are starting out first in the job and have a cutting edge research lab because there is a level of trust that they that the world has already given you by offering you 100k mm. the world takes a bets on your previous state uh, in a state flow diagram if you want to call it the world is not great at picking you up, up from anywhere and putting you in that state the world is only good at picking you from the t minus 1 state and getting you to t it is upon you to somehow get to t minus 1 t minus 2 take the trajectory or if you can parachute yourself rocket yourself into some other infinite state that you want great but those are exceptions work with probabilities most people they learn probability in school and they forget probability that means uh, if i just say this high school dropout made 1 million dollars people somehow attach that they can also be in that path mm. but if i just say the same thing that 100000 people have bought the lottery and one person who bought the lottery has won a small scooter now people then understand probability otherwise they just think millionaire if they drop out or some i'm just i'm just taking drop out as an example yeah the the social media is all about selling what happens to 0.0001% to 99.9999% and gaining views leverage that is social media for you in one line mm-hmm. this guy has a 180k offer sitting remotely in a village in india that is what is the population of india 1. even more than china 1.4 billion or something wow you are talking about 1/6th probability of the world predominantly the world has a 7 whatever be now the unfortunate thing is that that 1/6th probability in the whole world of 7 plus billion people now that is made as an aspirational goal for poor guy who has not even studied up to 10th class uh, not even passed high school with a youtube thumbnail that's the world we are living in mm. it is upon you to realize carry forward what you have learned probabilities even on to the real world and uh, for professionals um essentially treat time uh, treat money as freedom 
beyond middle class once you pass the middle class barrier see if you can add any delta uh, by trading of time taking years off uh, both for yourself and for the world if you can um otherwise a lot of people are all about building on one top of the other not taking much risks mm-hmm. fair enough if either one should be happy with the person not taking risk identify themselves with the person not taking risks and be fine there or be the guy who take risks and uh, do that thing mm-hmm. but if not you should not be complaining about your 9 to 5 etc be happy with what you want mm. and uh, live life the same way but uh, i would say one thing whatever you do be prepared for a remote retirement less retirement less uh, fractional fractionally operated ownership world that will come in 20 years uh be prepared for that mm-hmm. either you are prepared for that with money with run time don't just be blinded uh by what's happening and just draw and even if you're drawing good salary invest for that either with freedom etc mm-hmm. um i look at it that way i mean today i feel very confident that i never have to retire i mean my father retired i felt the pain of him staying idle uh how all of a sudden the value of life is lost the purpose is lost mm-hmm. uh i felt that very deeply because <clears throat> he lives part with me and part with my sister mm-hmm. so i saw that up so close. like a decline almost right or or just yeah, right up yeah hmm. he is trying to find a jobs here and there but uh, sometimes he finds and sometimes uh, he's like 68 now so the the question that he gets is that if i can employ someone at 25 and give them a new brand new life why should i employ you at 68 mm. uh, especially in a country like india yes. where there is a lot of unemployment so uh, that's a it's a valid real life question that he gets all the time whenever he tries to apply for you know small part time jobs in teaching etc um but i kind of view at it like i should never retire yes at least i know what i need what i can do because i've built at least 50k following i can just keep writing random stuff to them or keep uh, making you random youtube blogs whatever it is i can keep up with the technology fortunately i can just write on the next open source module that got released whatever even when i'm 70 mm-hmm. and just keep building on that and i know that and i know one i will tell you one more very very fundamental life changing thing that i encountered in entrepreneurship uh, especially with a kid mm-hmm. um whenever i didn't get good marks my father used to be terrified for the right reasons who is going to give employment what's going to happen to him when he enters the workforce especially in a cutthroat company like india with 1.4 billion people working for survival no nothing wrong with it absolutely true i am luckily through the entrepreneurship process whatever be it i am in a very happy position if my kid doesn't do well in school i don't panic mm. i know the at least a baseline survival for him whether it is being a creator whether it is exploring his own passions and trying to make money from it in one way or the other or just marrying his passion with whatever is the current technological or high paying job skill set at the time marrying bridging that leverage i am confident now i don't bank on bank any more on he graduating and an employer giving him a first job and that great if it happens but that should not be the defining purpose of his life mm. and even part of our lives as parents wow it is not anymore and i'm glad it is when are you going to teach your your child ai uh i let him learn very slow no pressure at all mm. my wife is like <laughs> he's three and a half 
he just like you know does a b c d and all this uh, somehow i am like i have no pleasure i mean because one thing we didn't touch upon is i've had some at some scale some health issues whether it is with digestion and other mm. things etc where uh, predominantly every major scanning that exists in the world mri is all those i've been through that i have a very different perspective of life i now after go- going through that mm. which is i know it is it is very hard to just balance life you need to balance yourself once you have a, a relationship the partner once you have decide to have kids that especially that with the dynamics of your siblings that that are dynamics of your retired parents it is life is extremely complicated in the very basic sense of how it is structured at least the modern life yes so the uh, so i i absolutely have no pressure in the sense that i just want him to be a happy kid mm like my wife doesn't agree with me it partly yeah yeah it it is i think she thinks it's a very low bar to be sure uh, maybe when he graduates i might put some competing things i want him to compete in some things but at least for now as of today if he if he is successful good or else i i just want him to be like absolutely happy kid mm-hmm. happy with himself whether he has job whether he has nothing etc learn to just be happy by himself because i know he is going to go to a new place new country if he decides to loneliness and lot, there are a lot of things in life he might be hit with loneliness or he might be hit with financial crunch or some other obstacle in a new country new place if he learns to be happy i know at least the baseline is set where success is a bonus if it happens mm. i don't know if it changes if i get more mature and be more competitive looking at his his friends etc but as of today that's the only bar that i have for him <laughs> interesting that <laughs> yeah hmm hmm this is this has been good uh, i had more questions but okay so here's a here's a rapid round of three questions right you're stuck on an island sure and this island has a specialized chef. The chef could order any materials from anywhere blah blah blah, could cook whatever you want, but he can only cook two things. And there's no restrictions on what he can cook. Most decadent thing that you mm. can think of. But you're going to stay on this island for the next mm. 10 years. What are the two meals that you have him cook or who or whoever? They whatever. I think very easy for me. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Because I I all I mean not exact question but I have a two binary f- priority food for me in my life mm. in the sense that for the afternoon I'll have plain steamed white rice hot rice mm-hmm. with dal that is lentil soup mm-hmm. and pickle indian pickle that's it. that's my let's say happy food in the afternoon uh, then night I always think about it what's the final food if when i know when i am going to go what's the final food yeah, i yeah. think it's hyderabadi chicken dum biryani mm. uh, chicken dum biryani mm-hmm. so yeah these two fits just altering between uh, afternoon and dinner i think i'm i'm totally fine yeah we got to go <laughs> okay all right i like that um what's one thing that brings you joy um constant exploration mm I would do it with no incentive. Yes. And that I, I derive I derive my life's happiness through that constant exploration. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. one thing that sits above everything even me. Uh yeah. That's beautiful. So his last question is not meant uh to be surrounded about you want to be famous etc cetera, etc cetera. it's more of basically what you've been saying this entire podcast in terms of think of plan for 2035 or plan for x so what do you want people to remember about you hmm interesting thing i'll split it in two parts okay one is the selfish part 
and the other thing is non selfish part okay. uh mm, okay the first part the, the shortest answer that i think one one of my friend gave me gave to another friend telling about me which is what i want people to remember even is um put him a price tag like 1 million 1 million dollars or 10 million dollars whatever it is he can do anything and everything under the sun mm. it doesn't have to be even in tech i i tell the same with same thing with my sister she's like a general surgery i mean general physician right give me 6 months 10 million dollar price tag i'll be a brain surgeon i'll be heart surgeon doesn't matter i have the exploration to achieve that so similarly my friend once described he described in tech basically uh, he doesn't work for you in the sense that he is busy with other things but if you really put 1 million dollars he will do anything and everything that you want him to accomplish mm. something like that yes that's what i want people to be remembered there was this one guy you just have a problem in life i mean it doesn't have it, if it's with tech i'm more suitable but in general uh, you have a problem technical or research or whatever it is you put a price tag this guy will just get it done mm-hmm. that's it no questions asked uh, yeah that's one part 2 is what do i want to be remembered so i get this question all the time from my wife Ah. what's your real real end goal of whatever you write every day you do these things is there an end goal like what's your threshold my threshold is simply uh one thing i am stranded somewhere in the world in that country i should receive help in one hour i should be just enough influential to receive help in one hour that means for example i went on a road trip to i don't know south africa australia got into let's say an accident or something unfortunate i just, i'm just stranded there i post it on my linkedin or twitter hey i am visiting visiting adelaide australia can someone offer me accommodation or just help me for the day i'm distressed stranded in the middle with family that's my only bar there's distress available and you know sometimes it's not just about ambulance coming in right it's more about let's say you lost your uh wallet in the country it's about someone who you have who associate or know you take you home for the day tell that not, nothing is hap- no worry just stay here and i'll get things sorted for you mm. you need some touch point beyond just calling 911 or ambulance thing right mm-hmm. that's the only affinity level that i think if i get there fine enough i don't need like huge uh, none of those infra- distress help that's distress it, help i like that <laughs> wow ramji this has been uh, i i've really enjoyed this conversation we definitely went uh, an hour over Likewise. and i i thoroughly um thought it was worth the time The one thing that stuck out to me is I'm I'm going to maybe optimize my life for being an occasional mosquito. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoy that one and you know thanks very much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I'll make sure to post a ton of things in the show notes and you know I if people really listen to the end of this episode and they take your lessons to heart, I think they'll have a good good fruitful micro SaaS filled life. <laughs> awesome i mean first of all absolutely thanks a lot for your both patience enthusiasm and it i think it is the longest pod i have more than the longest being the longest podcast it is the most deepest pod i have been on mm. exploring mm. multiple dimensionality of let's say even philosophical how i view about world Uh, most of them are technical around saas or uh, you know whatever i build open source work most have been centered around that this explored another dimension basically 
you gave a gift to me that i can show it to my kid once he once he learns to understand english mm. that's the first thing that is going to watch and this is my father that's what he would understand mm-hmm. I, I, mm-hmm. and it doesn't happen organically right i cannot ask someone to ask me these questions and i tell them this philosophy it it so naturally happened through your podcast and i'm glad i have something that's from the future that will help directly my kid in the future to understand me without explaining who i am and what i do you know one i want to appreciate you you know saying that on record or not even on record but just telling me that because um i think similar to yourself i've i've been fortunate i know you talked about some of your health scare and and how that sort of shifted your perspective on what is important and i i too similar had 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 many recent experiences especially with death um you got friends die who, who die really young very suddenly right. so it, may, it really makes you call things into perspective and you had talked about metrics so one of my metrics for this podcast is when someone dies that their family could come watch this and enjoy um remembering that person and you know so i i appreciate you calling that out and i'm i'm happy that you felt that that's what's most important you know so even if it gets this gets zero yeah. views i i've claimed success <laughs> in in my own in my own right you know so amazing amazing and thanks for being that host like patiently and inquisitively uh, asking those questions uh i absolutely loved it fantastic well i have a lot to learn from you in in future things and i'm always happy to bring you on the pod again especially i think open research is a is a beautiful topic because um you know i have a phd i now i didn't go to the top school so i i have some perspective on if you did not make it into a top school how you sort of enter echelons I am blessed to work for the top machine learning company in the world. So I I I take that with high responsibility that not everyone has that opportunity. So for me open right. research uh making certain information available, giving people I think the skills of using multi GPUs, I think that's a very coveted skill it's not an easy skill to um sort of come by. So a lot of the work that you do I deeply respect because you are really enabling people whose families did not have the opportunities to send them to America to learn and i i want to definitely commend you for continuing to do that and i'm glad to see that you're getting ample recognition for the things that you do thank so, you so it was a pleasure yeah and we'll we'll have a we'll have some more conversations take care absolutely absolutely take care all right